and welcome to today's program. This is your health chart which looks at various health matters and other related issues. Today we are looking at the cholera situation in the country as by 30th of January 2024. I'm pleased and glad to have Dr. in our studios, Dr. Mazianga Diwewe. Welcome to our program. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, Faith. All right, thank you. Doctor is coming from the Zambia National Public Health Institute, and she is the Director of Public Health Policy, Diplomacy, and Communication. Doctor, how are we doing as an institute? Well, um, in a tough space, but very hopeful. Um, it's not the first time we've had this kind of a battle. Uh, we've had this battle before, and we're just coming out of a very bad three years with the COVID-19, but have merged uh, quite victorious with, you know, the majority of people at least having survived. Not to underrate or under, uh, you know, um, the, the death of, of the few people that um, occurred, but I think the majority of people, uh, you know, survived uh, through this COVID. Okay. And now, as regards to the cholera situation, mm -hmm. which is countrywide, how are we faring? Um, so, Faith, what's important to note that while it's a countrywide infection, the epicenter is Lusaka. Over 90% of our cases are in Lusaka province, and of those, more than 95% are actually in Lusaka district. And uh, when we've done our analysis on the cases that have occurred in the other parts of the country, what we've noted is that a lot of the cases that they're experiencing in their uh, districts are actually important cases from Lusaka. So somebody travels from Lusaka and, you know, they are already carrying the bacteria and by the time they are reaching, they are ill and, um, of course, have to be taken to the healthcare facility. So we have that kind of a mixture ongoing. So the majority of cases are really coming from Lusaka district. Yeah. Now, looking at that, and you even noted, so the epicenter is Lusaka. Mm -hmm. How much have we reached the masses? just to educate them or to inform them of what is happening and what they should do? So um, we have different strategies to engage our communities. Uh, first of all, in the response pillar, uh, pillars, uh, one of the pillars that we have is called risk communication and community engagement. What does that mean? We need to inform the public of what is going on. And platforms like this are enhancing that, um, that role for us to communicate to the public what is going on and how do we respond to this situation. Then we have to engage the community now in a more detailed manner. So in the, in, in the community, we have our colleagues called community-based volunteers um, who we train, um, give tools and information which they then pa uh, pass on to the communities to educate, help educate our communities. And as they do that, they just don't go with the word. They also go with things like chlorine, and now we've also added ORS to ensure that the households that are at high risk are um, uh, you know, supported with some of these things that can be used for prevention. So when we go into the community, we talk about, first we, we make them understand what the disease is, what the symptoms are, how the disease is transmitted, and how it can be prevented. So this is ongoing. In fact, um, I think tomorrow we'll be training another cohort of these community-based volunteers. It's an ongoing process. And uh, when we see, because we, we also go to we do some observations, we do some um, cap surveys to understand what is really going in the community. And when we find new information, we reorient these community-based volunteers so that they can go in to answer those queries. We also have what we call a call center where people call in and um, they'll ask some of those questions. You know, people have called to say, I don't even know how to mix my chlorine and so on. And so we have to know which, which chlorine they have because it depends on, on the, some of them. You can just use the top of the lid into 20 liters of water, but it's like one part of uh, chlorine into nine parts of water. So, but you know, that has to be explained. And that's why in the community you actually do demonstrations so that they really understand what, you are, um, what the principle is behind that. Yeah. That is actually great. Uh, at least if we can engage the community, then we are heading somewhere. And now we saw at some point uh, where the minister received vaccines in the country. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you, you have reached as to so many. But do we still have enough? 
<laughs> I like that question, Faith. So, for cholera, there are two um, strategies that we use. When there are enough vaccines, we do what we call preemptive vaccination campaigns. And uh, we've been doing that over the years, actually. So what we did um, was to first do a risk assessment to understand where our hotspots are, where, th where are the areas we usually get cholera and we're able to identify some of the places. So we know that this is a hotspot, this is a hotspot, and so on. And so in those areas, we have conducted what we call preemptive vaccination campaigns. Then you have a situation like it has happened now or like happened in Vubi last year. In Vubi, it was even worse because they've never had uh, that, uh, that um, a cholera outbreak. And so it's not even on our list of um, hotspots. Lusaka at least is the, on the list of hotspots. Mm -hmm. And so there we had to do reactive um, vaccination campaigns, which is what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. So we had a little close to about 2,000, 2 million vaccines, and you know, um, the population of Osaka is much more than that. And so we had to strategize on how to uh, do the campaign and we opted to vaccinate the people in the highest at risk areas. So in the hotspots of Lusaka province. So within Lusaka, we had four, four sub districts, you know, Chipata, Matero, Kanyama, Chawama. Th that's where the situation is dire and worse. So th that is the community we targeted first. Then there are places like Chongwe, Rufunsa, and Luangwa in specific areas where we also took some vaccines. And I'm happy to say that we've had a very good response. Um, of course, we did meet some people who didn't want to take the vaccine, yes. um, but uh, we have reached our target numbers. Yeah, in terms of the coverage, I think the people we're targeting were almost at 100% in most of the areas. And Looking at that, because I wanted to come to that one, to know mm -hmm. the response from the community. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned of Bubi. How is it in terms of response? They said because we are talking of it being the first time mm -hmm. when they're experiencing mm -hmm. this. Is the response still the same as that which you're receiving from Lusaka? So, um, in fact, for Bubi, because of the outbreak in the neighboring countries, we had learned that there was an outbreak in Malawi and Tanzania, yeah. and uh, sorry, Malawi yeah. and um, Mozambique. And so even before we started to see cases, we already started to engage our community. We had already gone in with our chlorine. We had already gone in with our health education, preparing them. If you see a case like this, please, healthcare facility. Uh, start with ORS as you are proceeding to the healthcare facility. But what we saw, uh, and, what, and so when the cases started to happen, the community was already aware and they responded immediately. So even in Bubu, we finished our vaccination campaign within a very short period of time. Yeah. Well, viewers, we are looking at the cholera situation countrywide and just to have an overview of what is happening, what ZNPHI is doing, the response it is taking, to see to it that we provide the best for our people. Let's take a break. Kodi kole la ni chani? Kole la ni matenda otulula. Munto amena dola matenda ya kole la ama tulula kwa mbili ni kusanza. Dotila keli makalanga ti mazi mwumwa tsukila mpunga. Ndipo munto wa dola kole la mazi mtupila ke ama ata gamba kutihia machoka kwa mbili kupiole la mkusanza ndi kutulula kwa mbili. Munto wa dola kole la anga mwalire maula kumi ndi ya wili ka kuti 12 hours ngati sana la nile mwamsanga tandizo la mankwala. Kodi muntu angatengile mota ni matenda akolela. Kumwa mazi adoti. Kudia za kudia, ndi mmanjamosa samba mwa doti. Kapena kukulisa nchido mbali zotsuki wa ndi mazi adoti. Kudia za kudia, zimene zinangosi wa mosa samala posa gunikida. Kudia za kudia, zo zizira, za chimbala, zimene zinasungi wa bueno. Kudia za kudia, zimene ama gulita mpebete mwa miseu. Kudia zipatu, ndi ndi oza masamba zo satsuka. Kodi kolera, inga chinchiti ziwe. Gadu sani mazi anu wakumwa, kapena kukulisa nchito klorine. Samba ni manja, ndi mazi au kondo, ndi soko, mkamaliza kukulisa nchito shimbuzi. Kundi tani za kudia mkwalebe kuyamba kudia. Osadia za kudia zimene zima kulitiwa mpepete mwamiseu. Mwene na kubwini kila za kudia kuwapeta uti nchia nchia zinga kakeko. Ntawe zonse, mwene na kukulisa nchito shimbuzi. Pewan kukulitsa nchito machemba kapena maplastiki ngati chimbuzi. 
Onani kuti doti ilitaiwa mchimbuzi. Ntawi zonse onani kuti zimbuzi zikala za ukondo. Ndipo ntawi zonse mbambo wa chimbuzi chanu pazikala pobuini kila guno guino. Okubwele sanu utenga uyu ndi au nduna wa za umoyo. Welcome back. We are looking at the cholera situation in Zambia as by 30th of January 2024. I have Dr. Mazianga Liwewe, who is the Director, Public Health Policy, uh, Diplomacy and Communication. Doctor, we are looking at various issues and just an overview of what is happening or what has happened since we had this outbreak. Mm -hmm. There were some concerns, uh, you know, when you just uh, made that center, the heroes, yes. that uh, families were not being informed in good time in case of, you know, a death, uh, maybe the, pas uh, the patient has been moved from one center to the other. Mm -hmm. What is the current situation now? So um, first things first, Faith, is yes. that um, Heroes is not a hospital. Heroes is a stadium, a sports stadium. Usually, uh, you know, um, we have soccer there and so on. What we had to do was to find a centralized place to manage the many cases that were coming up. Because what we're seeing is that some of the facilities, remember we have a lot of patients already with other ailments. And what we're beginning to see is that some of the facilities were being overwhelmed with the number of patients. And the cholera patient must be isolated to ensure that you don't um, allow transmission of infection to the other patients who are suffering from other things or other people. And so we had to convert a place uh, to be able to support the big numbers that we're experiencing at that time. You remember at the peak in uh, mid-January, we're seeing 700 and something cases a day, new cases. Then you'll have those who are due already. Where, uh, uh, level was having up to 1,000 people, uh, you know, admitted and so on. And so uh, we had to set up systems. We had to get um, trained uh, train quickly people to manage the data and things like that. So definitely, the first few days were tough in, in, in managing the information. But as it is now, we have a tracker, uh, data has been entered, and so everybody's in the system, and the status of that patient is known. So we know this one is in Heroes, and we're connecting to the, the other cholera treatment units in the smaller facilities, and we know, oh, this one has been transferred to Levy, oh, this one has it actually didn't come, they are still at uh, Kanyama, and, and things like that. So we have definitely improved the, the, the process. Well, that is good. I'm sure families are already in that state to know to say they are safe and their uh, members are actually safe. Yeah, I think there was a lot of concern. Uh, and I remember one time trying to engage the crowd out there, and they were <laughs> almost like, <laughs> Leeching me and, and my colleague, Dr. Kalanga, because what are you saying? Yes, Can you just tell us if my relative is there or not? Yes. Um, it's better I know if my relative is dead yes, and I move on than being anxious about it. Yes. Um, so I understand the, the concern, I understand the worries, and uh, we're apologetic that uh, we we're not able to set up quickly, but um, like has been said, we have improved in our information management. Thank you so much. Doc, we've featured so many uh, stakeholders on this platform. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the concerns that have come out is that there's no coordination between, you know, the ministries, the PHI, and the stakeholders. What is your take as an institute? So, um, like I said earlier on, it's not the first time we're fighting cholera. Mm -hmm. And we have mechanisms, coordination mechanisms already in place. And depending on the severity of the situation, so if you have just one district experiencing an outbreak, then in that, that the district is given the, facility, um, the, the responsibility to manage the outbreak. And we at national level, at central level, support them. So we maybe do resource mobilization, uh, technical assistance, but they're the ones who are leading. When it spreads beyond that district, we now have to engage now the provincial level because it's beyond one district mm -hmm. so the provincial level takes charge and then now when it's inter uh, um, province like beyond one province it changes now to national level supervision or management of the case so um the institute as you know is the 
arm mandated, the technical arm mandated by government to safeguard public health security. And uh, we sit under the Ministry of Health. But our responsibilities span around surveillance and disease intelligence. And through the systems, working with our colleagues in the district, we're able to determine that mm, we're seeing too many diarrhea cases here. What is happening? And then our lab teams are able to confirm what is really happening. And oh, it is actually cholera. Oh, no, it's not cholera. It's actually something else. It's food poisoning and so on and so forth. And then, you know, a response is mounted. And before a situation even happens, we know the common things that affect us. So we have what we call um, epidemic preparedness plans. And, uh, and so we just bring that onto the table and put it into action. So uh, when it becomes uh, beyond what we can manage, the ministry now, the mother body, is in charge in terms of the health sector. But in all these things, we use a multi-sectoral approach so whether it's at district level community level uh, province level national level it's all a multi-sector approach so right now the, the office of the vice president is leading the response and is able to call upon every sector that should be responsible all the stakeholders that should be responsible so we have our council of ministers that sits there and representing the different sectors that uh, you know are important to this situation and then uh, we have a committee of permanent secretaries who are now the liaisons between the technocrats, us the technocrats, and the policy makers, guiding the ministers with policy direction, having been informed with what we are gathering as technocrats and so on. So we have all these coordination mechanisms. In the provinces, uh, the, the DCs, um, in the districts, the DCs coordinate those meetings. In the provinces, you have the PSAs coordinating those systems at national level. So all those things, it depends on the sta stage at which the outbreak is. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the, the issue of you know, a multi-sectoral approach. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned of technocrats, you've mentioned of ministers, you've mm -hmm. mentioned of the, uh, DCs. Are we seeing a situation where you are going to engage these companies? Because they're the ones who produce this uh, you know, litter. As we, we know, uh, cholera is associated with the dirty. Mm -hmm. And this uh, solid waste, most mm -hmm. of it, is being manufactured in some companies of some sort. Are you engaging these companies to see to it that they are part of the solution? Because they're the ones creating this disease. Mm -hmm. So us as uh, the health sector, yeah. our role is to cure mm -hmm. and um, health educate so that we, we prevent some of these diseases. Mm -hmm. And so we, when we look at our data, we see that this is what is causing, uh, you know, the burden of disease in our country. Oh, we're seeing too much hypertension. We're seeing too much of this. Then we inform the public uh, to understand how to prevent or how to control their situations. But for those things that you're talking about, there are other sectors that are responsible. And that's why at that platform, even when they sit as ministers, they will say, ah, ah Mona, this is your role, this is your role, this is your role. It's okay, Abba. Let's all do what we must do. And, uh, and they're di being directed to do that. And I think you heard the president the other day instruct all the sectors to be on board and ensure that what they are responsible for, they must um, uh, 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 push their agenda. Okay. And anyway, looking at today's topic, you know, where we are looking at generally the cholera situation in Zambia as of today. Mm -hmm. um, how are the cases uh, uh, generally? Are we seeing these cases reducing? Fortunately, we are seeing a reduction in the number of new cases. Um, remember, at the peak, we were talking about over 700 cases in a day, new cases mm -hmm. in a day. Yes. But now we've gone down to less than 300 cases a day. Uh, even our, our mot uh, mortality rate, our death rate has reduced. We are seeing not, we are not, it's not even reaching 20 now. Uh, they've reduced. Um, sadly, the majority of people dying um, are dying in the community before they can get to the healthcare facility. Uh, we've improved in terms of the case fatality rate from the healthcare facility. We've seen it's really reduced. Uh, yesterday, I think we had like four people who died within, across the country, who died within the healthcare facility. So um, 
In terms of numbers, definitely we are seeing uh, a, a reduction in the number of cases, the number of deaths, but the emphasis is that we are not yet in the clear. So remember there are issues of flash floods, uh, you know, causing um, overflow of latrines uh, and things like that. So what we're doing now, what our colleagues in, in local government are doing is going into these places to dislodge uh, the latrines, burying the shallow wells. We have a uh, Ministry of Water uh, taking, uh, and the Water Utility, taking and building, erecting tanks, and then taking water there. At those points, we have chlorination points. We have somebody who's standing there to make sure that your water is chlorinated as you go with it home. We have what we call um, oral rehydration points where you can also go and get water, you can go and get ORS, and you can even be assessed to determine your status. If you see that, you see your we refer you to the clinic so that you can be managed um, timely with either an IV uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Look, I asked that question because mm. we are we are seeing and we are hearing mm -hmm. of some public places being closed. So that's why I asked that question mm -hmm. to say, are we reducing in terms of numbers? What is causing that? So while we are reducing in terms of numbers, we have to make sure that we don't have a resurgence. And therefore, uh, we ha our health inspectors have to go and see that the people who are providing public services mm -hmm. are complying to the public health regulations to ensure that their clients are getting into a safe space. Remember before we got onto this interview, I was talking about uh, when I went to, when I, I, I was in the company of the minister in Chawama, and they are seeing people sitting like this, but not on such, such a clean environment. There's a drainage there, and you can see that that water looks dirty and is contaminated. And you are busy on a paper, sharing with your pools and drinking and putting your drink on the, on the, on the ground. Um, you know, so we have to make sure that those places are clean. Mm. Those places have to provide a, a good sanitary facilities with running water, clean toilets. But see, the people there don't seem to care about the clientele and just don't even clean the place. It's just, and I think that there are people, if there are people like me, they, they are the ones who probably say, mm -mm, because you can't just enter that place. Okay. And then there are people who are worse who just go and do the number two, Kumbuyo. Yeah. Then the rains will come. If those fe fe that fecal matter is contaminated, it just flows and contaminates your shallow wells and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Really, I think our people really need an education. They need to be communicated to. But as ZMPH High, uh, how much are we involving and engaging our communities so, mm. so that at least they get to know what is there? And the stakeholders, mm -hmm. the companies that have mentioned, mm -hmm. how are we engaging them or how best can we engage them to see to it that at least mm -hmm. we just save a life? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you've seen how my minister has been in the community. The idea is to understand what is going on, to understand the mindset of the people, to see the realities of what is happening, so that then we use that information to inform policy, to inform program. What is the next step? Guys, the, the wells are, be, are being contaminated with overflows from the latrines. We see that. So what is next? Who's responsible? Guys, can we deal with this? Look at the waste that is there. We found a dump site, and apparently it's an illegal dump site. It's not a, a you know, a, a, a mandated dump site. Just in the compound? Yes. So there are people who go there to dump from all over the places, maybe even from those business spaces you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Then there are people who go and now start picking, the scavengers are picking now things that can be recycled, recyclable, mm -hmm. so they can now take to the recycling um, places. So um, we're doing a lot of engagement, we're doing a lot of education, and remember I mentioned earlier on that we have a cadre called community-based volunteers who we keep training and retraining to keep going into those communities to make the people understand the situation as it is and what they can do to avoid um, this cholera. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great, and I'm sure we are getting somewhere. But I think we're getting somewhere. Yes. But as an institute, how much are you engaging the media? Because I know if you were to do that, this uh, information, uh, the much needed information to mm -hmm. the masses, definitely to get there. Yeah. Or maybe just, uh, you know, 
capacity building in terms mm. of uh, maybe it could even be workshops to enlighten this, you know, cadre that yeah. we could call the media. And I'm sure it can be a great deal. Yeah. Maybe just uh, an example of facilitating their mobility, mm. you know, just to make sure that we, we get the correct yeah. data and we get first-hand information. Yeah. How yeah. much are you doing in terms of engaging the media? So I, I like that question, and mm -hmm. I think that we're improving. Um, just last year, I think I had three uh, workshops or what we call media cafes, mm -hmm. where we engaged um, media personnel. Unfortunately, all of them last year happened in Lusaka, but uh, we are trying to see how we can improve engaging beyond that. And there are certain partners we are bringing on board who have experience and who also have um, good um, relationships, and they, they have a base, um, a group of, uh, you know, a community of practice. Yeah, and that's what we're trying to build. We're actually, for the Institute, we're trying to build a community of practice. And so we have a database of certain reporters who we know are engaged in health communication or health journalism and so on. And uh, we want to train. As a matter of fact, I think in the next week or two, we'll be having another uh, training to just, you know, uh, uh, capacitate um, our important cadres as you mentioned, um, who are important in um, information dissemination. And because we see that we're fighting on the social media platforms with the people who put in all sorts of, all manner of myths and miscommunication. And so to manage that, we have to have people who have a real d correct, accurate data in real time to be able to publish that. So it's work in progress, but um, I'm happy to say that uh, we are already in that engaged uh, platform, and of course, the, uh, there's still room for further improvement. Wow, that, that's great to hear. But maybe just in closing, what would be a word of appeal to the general public? So, you know, I like to say health uh, starts with me. Good behavior starts with me. Everything starts with me. Because if I do it, and you do it as I, and the next person does it as I, together we've done it. And so we, first of all, as parents, we must take responsibility of our children to educate our children. Yes, a lot of, not a lot, but maybe quite a number of people are comfortable to say, oh, my child goes to school. Why we put it to school? How much do you know your child has learned? You as a parent should take time to re-educate and ensure that your child grows up knowing the correct way of living. Somebody was just saying that, you know, when we're growing up, our parents would be upset with you if you're going to sleep without washing the dishes. But now you find in some homes, huh, even, you know, they can be washed tomorrow because the children are tired. They're tired from watching TV, not tired from working and things like that. So charity begins at home. So uh, the, co the message to the community is that you need to start in your household. And uh, collectively, you'll find that it impacts on everybody. And the prevention me measures of cholera are easy. They're straightforward. What we're saying is make sure the water that you're drinking is clean, clean and safe. And how do you do that? Boil it or chlorinate it? We can't assure you about the other waters, where they come from, how safe they are. The only water I can say to you, Faith, is safe is the one you have boiled or you have chlorinated. And that's the water you must use for drinking. The children must use for drinking. That's the water you must use for your cooking. But also your environment must be clean. You are going to cook or to a toilet straight from Bali, or even dishing. You have not washed your hands and so on. You must make sure you wash your hands with soap and water before you handle food. Um, before eating and after eating, especially after coming back from the toilet. That is a must. So simple, basic rules that every human being should be able to do would go a long way in preventing the continued transmission of cholera and, you know, the cause of these outbreaks. Wow. Doc, that's well said. I'm sure the listeners have gotten one or two things from what you have said. Thank you for honoring to our invitation. It's always a pleasure, and thank you for having me. All right, thank you. Well, viewers, you've heard it for yourselves. We had Dr. Mazianga Liwewe, who is coming from ZNPHI, which is Zambia National Public Health Institute. She is the Director of Public Health Policy, Diplomacy, and Communication. We were looking at the cholera situation in Zambia as by 31st of January 2024. We have been your host, Faith Mutale, and from the entire production team, it's goodbye and pleasant viewing.
Hena kore la nizi, kore la buruwa zibu wa kusomo wana. Imu ntuji siko buruwa zibu wa kore la, ulasomo wana guru kakapati. Itubi tulamenda menda manji. Imu nwazi, ulawanyo takapati, agambu kakumana kwa menda mubili. Imu nwazi iwa kore la, uunga wahwa, umawola alo ali twelufu, gumbu kutita jena busiri sibuli kaboto. Hena mwuzira ili buti mtu, bwango ya kujana buruwa zibu wa kore la, Igu nyo menda, alo ata wikibyo musa muja tusunda, na menda aji sitombe. Igu lia jagulia, jalo igu bereha manza, ata sahigwa igabuto. Na igu bereha mitiwa na hiwi, jalo ata sahigwa, ami musa mu, na mwa menda aji si imusa mu, walo uja tusunda. Igu lia jagulia jita unigidwe, jalo jakarwa nzinini. Igu lia jagulia jito ntola, jalo jalegekwa, na jajilo. Jalo jeneo tija yoburu wakaboto. Igulia jagulia jamu mazila. Igulia imijelo na jihumani jalo jatasahiku wakaboto. Hena mwuzira ili buti mtu mbwakwa ya ugwa vila buru wa zimu wa korela. Igubu na masimpe kuti wabagwa ananganya kaboto menda agunywa. Igwinda mwugubu na masimpe kuti ajigwa na igubi kwa musamu wa klorin. Amusambe mwumanze nukubele hansipa. Na amenda abidu kwa musamu uja tuzunda, mwama na kuberi haji mbuzi. Amu jisibige, na angu jika saha, ija kudia, gamta na agu jidia. Amu honige, ija kudia, jindi yonze, igute kwa kuti, jitaka kwa nzinini. Mutari ija kudia, jagura umazila. Amu berehe, iji mbuzi, jindi yonze. Amu litanta mune, mugu berehe higumbuli, na tupepalu wa plastiki. Mugu soa tubi. Ambo ni masimpe kuti tubi. Tuwa soo kwa na igubi kwa moje mbuzi. Ambo ni masimpe kuti jimbuzi jindi jomasa gaji salala. Na gaji huni gitwe. Oimulo mbe wale tuwa gulindu ye. Alamu tabulanga nyansewa mojisi.